Africa's Roadmap is proudly brought to you by Imperial. Now, with more than half of uh, the 10 fastest growing economies globally situated in Africa, the continent has indeed become a prime investment destination for many an international company. It's also prime real estate for those wanting to branch out regionally from one African country to the next, and even more so for companies operating in the FMCG sector, retail as well as pharmaceutical. But the continent is not homogenous, with 54 unique players each with their own set of opportunities and challenges. What does this mean for companies who want to move their goods, products across the various borders? That's the topic of today's conversation, uh, Africa's Roadmap. Hello and welcome, I'm Godfrey. Joining me on the show today to share the ideas and insights into the logistics and transport sector in Africa, I have uh, beginning on my far left, uh, Andrew Shaw. He's Associate Director, Capital Projects and Invest Infrastructure Solutions, PW, TP, PwC. Uh, Dagi Truta, he is CEO Imperial Logistics Africa Division. Lyle Wild, Director of the Center for Dynamic Markets and Senior Lecturer Gibbs and Cobos Rousseau. He is Chief Business Development Officer at uh, Imperial Logistics. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Let's start the conversation by understanding what we're dealing with. I made reference to 54 African countries. They can become 56 if you remember the Sahara Arab Democratic Republic, Somaliland up there. So the complexity is there. So in terms of the challenges and opportunities, they are also uh, that diverse. Can I start with you, Andrew? Give us a lay of the land, if you like, in terms of the infrastructure and logistics challenges that Africa faces even, as I said in the intro, it's growing at probably its fastest pace since independence. Godfrey, we see growth in both East and West Africa of around 6%. And that's on the base of infrastructure that wasn't that great to start with. In many African countries, the infrastructure was poor, particularly transport infrastructure. Railways on both sides were in many instances non-existent. Some of the concessions are still struggling. Ports have improved. There's a number of private terminal operators. There's some port expansion projects. There's projects around road infrastructure expansion, but still with the kind of growth rates that we're experiencing, particularly in some of the bigger economies, Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, yeah. we do see massive shortfalls in infrastructure and also operationally um, weak operational provision of logistics service um, uh, requirements for, for customer growth in those particular regions. Yeah. But this whole environment is changing very rapidly with new players coming on board. Yeah. Now, one figure that we constantly bandy around is uh, there's an infrastructure gap that needs to be funded in Africa. People speak of about $50 billion, I think. Mm. That's a figure that comes from the African Development Bank. Uh, if I can come to you, Lyle, in terms of uh, finding money for that, uh, for, for that gap and also finding the right partners, because everybody talks about what government can do, but I think it's important that actually you have players outside of government because who, they don't have the money. We know it is the Imperials. We know it is the other logistics companies that have got the money that are able to actually help fund that gap. Yeah, look, Godfrey, I don't think it's a problem of, of finding finance. It is not. Um, you know, the, the numbers that are bandied around, the, the African Development Bank might have their number. Yeah. Uh, the World Bank estimates that you need $93 billion uh, worth of uh, or investing Funding in infrastructure every year, yeah, yeah. Every year to, to, to narrow that infrastructure gap. The biggest problem is implementation and you have companies, you have entities like you say, Imperial, that are willing to do this, mm -hmm. but we need to move this. In many ways, I believe that the economic um, story, eco the economic rising story is, is going at a f far faster pace than what the political mm -hmm. uh, reforms that are, that are under undergoing at the moment in Africa are taking place. So yeah. this is what we need to do. We need to f strike a balance between that because the reality of doing business in Africa is that there will always be a partnership between these private entities yeah. and government entities and institutions across the continent. Yeah, so really when we talk of challenges, we're talking about opportunities rather than challenges because we're going past that. I mean, Dagi, you are in the continent, so you are actually uh, putting into practice what ought to be done. Let's begin first with understanding the size and magnitude of the challenge and then how you are mitigating and trying to make sure the challenges are not challenges, they are opportunities to make money. Godfrey, again, you know, answering the question for 54 different countries yeah. is very difficult. So there are specific challenges in each of these countries. Yeah. Um, the focus of getting products into country, our focus is on, on getting the FMCG and pharmaceutical products mm. into countries. Yeah. So we are assisting the brand owners, the manufacturers, to sell to the rising consumer. Right. So that's what we are focusing on at Imperial. So infrastructure development, 
needs to happen, yeah. but there are ways around it to get the product into the market at this point in time. Yeah. So it's understanding each individual market on its own and then crafting a plan <coughs> that fits into that particular market. Yeah, understanding each market, but also looking at a clustering approach right. where the east, the west and the south are looked at differently. Um, Nigeria's, uh, the, the West has got added complexity where French West Africa yeah. is totally different to Nigeria and Ghana again. Yeah. So you can chunk it as you go along the continent. Yeah. Um, but you have to keep your focus on what it is that you want to do. Yeah. But Kobas, how do you do that? Do you build it around the regional blocks that have been uh, developed by the African Union? So we've got uh, the East African community in the East, we've got uh, uh, here in Southern Africa, SADAC, and then in the West we've got ECOWAS. So yes, our origins being in South Africa, we've yeah. clearly focused on Southern Africa as a specific area. And the, yes, the region allows us to develop that um, as a whole, yeah. but not only in, from, from a South African perspective, also looking at the trade between the countries. Right. In West Africa, we have a, a presence, um, specifically in, uh, in Ghana and Nigeria, yeah. and we have to look differently at, at French West Africa. Yeah. In East Africa, that community or that cluster offers specific opportunities to facilitate interaction in, in between the countries, but also getting product to the different markets, yeah. um, whether that's pharmaceutical or consumer products. Yeah, yeah. Now, when, when people speak about supply logistics, it sounds like a big, uh, complicated phrase. Let's break it down. What exactly do you mean? What are you moving to where and how? So our focus is on, on consumer products and pharmaceutical products. Right, that's And interior. we essentially do three things for our clients in Africa. Yeah. We get them there, so we move their product, store their product, perform the physical logistic services. But on top of that, we also s help them to sell their product. So mm -hmm. not only stopping at the logistics leg, right. but also building the capabilities to actually get the product into the, into the market yeah. and also help them to build their brand. So what we do, we take ownership of that entire activity on behalf yeah. of our multinational yeah. clients. Yeah. Yeah. And we perform that as a seamless activity yeah. for people to be able to leverage the demand in Africa. Yeah. Let me come to you, D uh, Dougie, because I think part of that process is taken across the border, isn't it? Now, when you talk borders across Africa, you're talking very complicated things. I can give you, I don't know how many stories about what has happened to me at borders. How do you guys do it? Well, uh, the operating companies that has been operating in these African countries yes. has got vast experience of crossing borders. Mm. So you must remember Imperial is a business that grow through acquiring businesses. Yes, and I wrote that story that, very well, by the and way. And that de-risks our, our, our operations quite a bit because you get into bed with someone that's been in a specific country for many, many, many years. Right. And they understand it much better than a South African mm -hmm. that goes into a territory and try to, to explain and to understand certain things. Yeah. So the people on the ground deals with the difficulties yeah. that are there on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. yeah. And from time to time, we get them together, they share their stories, especially where there are adjacent countries, and then they help each other to get it better. Yeah. They engage with the customers, they yeah. engage with the customers. So there's lots of interaction to make things better. Uh, and uh. sometimes it works and sometimes yeah, it, it doesn't work. Down. Absolutely. And a vehicle stands for a couple of days yeah. longer at a border crossing. Yeah. But those are the things that we have people on the ground to deal with. Yeah, I can tell you. Effective. I've heard stories of a week or two weeks, people actually carry ports so they can eat and, you know, uh, make sure they don't starve while they're still stuck at the border. But I want you two gentlemen to come in and talk about uh, this whole border process because we have seen changes. I mean, politically, we know what has happened. Economically, we know what has happened. But we also know that there's an attempt to try to make sure that those border crossing points actually work. The AFDB has got a program that they are implementing. From your guys' experiences and study, and Lyle, you've moved around the continent a little bit, are we getting to a situation where this is getting better and systems are being developed and skills are being transferred and people are actually able to do this faster? Yeah, um, Godfrey, I reckon, I, I think it is getting better, but it's a very slow process uh -huh. because what happens is we, we, we sign one-stop border posts. Uh, they, there's good intentions to implement this, to harmonize the processes. But it's a real mindset to, to change that because the people that have to change that are the people <coughs> on the border post. So you talk about these these trucks, for example, that wait for one, sometimes two weeks. At yes. Kassim the, the border post. I absolutely know about that. I've seen that. The border post between Zambia and the DRC, which is, you know, this is one of the craziest places you've ever been on earth. And you go there and there's, there's two and a half kilometers of trucks on either side lined up. Um, they are implementing or they have implemented a one-stop border post Haven't there. Haven't you forgotten by bridge? Now, Bite Bridge, is, uh, <laughs> Bite Bridge is still pretty easy when it comes to that. But, okay. but we, what we do, actually at Gibbs, we, one of the programs that we do, we do um, it's called Business Connectedness in Southern Africa, where we put MBAs on a bus and we take ah. them to the border post and they spend the night there to see 
the pain and agony that these guys have to go through to actually, and the agents, and they work with the agents overnight to look at how, how difficult it is to move products from South Africa to Maputo through that border post, which is actually one of the easiest border posts on yeah, the African continent. Yeah, yeah. Most of them come back saying, well, it's not that easy to do business in Africa because yeah. that is where the rubber hits the tarmac. Yeah. That is the difficult part. Yeah. And to make sure that this happens is a long process. And look, it is underway, so it is improving, yeah. but there's a lot of work to be done. And, I, and again, I want to repeat this is, yeah. It's all about mindset. That guy yeah. that is actually managing that one stop yeah. usually is accustomed to using two sets of papers, getting yeah. things done on both the South African side and perhaps the Mozambican side. Yeah, I'd love to see those theses actually. I'd really love to. Andrew, you want to add on to that? Um, yeah, I th look, I think we do see improvement. Casabulela is one of them that I've also been through, which is crazy. Um, where, where, where would you put a post is that? Uh, Casabulela, which is the, the, the DRC uh, Zambia okay. um, border post okay. where there's two, okay. weeks, yeah. two weeks of trucks um, standing there. I don't think it would have any reason to exist if there wasn't a border post there, but it's a huge, almost a large town because of these trucks that are all waiting. Sure. Um, what we do see though is that the trade agreements or the trade packs between countries in the different regions yeah. are starting to open up trade between regions. And I think this is the point that Kubis raised earlier was that um, the, you're getting regional blocks that are starting to, to come out of more uh, isolated country relationships previously. Right. And I think that's very positive. You know, uh, Africa's is it making a difference though? Because when you look at the way they work, I mean, you, used to, you look at the <coughs> African community, a much better uh, uh, regional body than, say, for instance, SADC, SADC, which has been like on for I don't know how many years. I grew up writing that story. Mm. That story has grown now, it's been overtaken by East, uh, Eastern Southern Africa. And then also you look at ECOWAS, much, much better as well. I mm. mean, they've got, I think, better movement here than the, there than here. I think that's true. I think what you're starting to see is East and West Africa becoming a little bit more aligned around their trade blocks and the benefits yeah. that they get out of that is they have actually a more structured, larger economy and so they yeah. can get economies of scale. You know, in yeah. Africa, inter-regional trade is around 11%, whereas in Southeast Asia, it's around 50%. Mm. And we need to get that up. And that's really what will play into developing these countries. If you can take uh, tea or other products that are grown regionally and yeah. actually build that, an African market around those products, yeah. you're beginning to actually develop a proper structured economy and that's yeah. really what Africa has been lacking. Yeah. And with the growth in the middle class, there is this opportunity now to start to be much more structural around where we take Africa to in the sort of next decade. Yeah, yeah. you want to add in something, Dougie? No, I just think East Africa has gotten it right much faster than SADC. Yeah. Mm. So as an and I'm very angry about a, it. A registered as an yeah. economic <laughs> operator there allows you to cross vehicles with just an ID book. Mm. Right. Mm. So the inter-regional, wow. the inter-country trade there is going to have a much faster yeah. uptake yeah. than what it's had in SADC. Do you remember the story from uh, YT Basson of uh, ShopRite? where you spoke, I can't remember the exact number now, but we're talking hundreds of documents that they need to be able to cross uh, the Southern African yes. border. Yeah, so, so East Africa is already, uh, already pulling ahead yeah. with um, working together. Ah. So you can cluster it around the regional blocks, or do you want to add something yeah, else? Yeah, I, I just want to add a different perspective. Yeah. The in, in terms of dealing with some of these challenges or opportunities, you also have to ask, what are you expecting of your business partners? Yeah. So if you employ a logistics company or a 3PL transport company yeah. to move product across the border, and the responsibility is to move the product only, right. there is the challenge of who's responsible for documentation and the okay. process at the border, okay. Okay. which often it falls down there, that the company or the brand owner would retain responsibility, uh, uh. and then if something goes wrong, you know, it's actually not, if I'm only a transporter, yeah. the fact that I wait at the border post is not really my problem. If you look at a more integrated approach towards the route to market, yeah. you take product from South Africa into Mozambique, and you're not only a cross-border transporter, but right. you actually have an interest in selling the product in Mozambique, right. because that's the service you offer. It, it, it results in a different approach to that yeah. value chain. Yeah. doesn't mean that the border post becomes easier, yeah. but if you take responsibility for yeah. that yeah. total route to market solution, we yeah. certainly have seen that that puts a different perspective uh, on it. Uh, uh, so it, I think it is also important of how we deal with some of these constraints. Right, yeah. right. Because if you purely transport, you may just get stuck because the documentation was wrong yeah, or yeah. you know the specific product codes or the permits were not in place. Yeah. So I think a, a part of that lesson is, and whether that's in South Africa or in our case where we distribute vast amounts of pharmaceuticals in East yeah. and West Africa, yeah. if you take full responsibility for the value chain on yeah. behalf of your client, sure. then that problem becomes part of the opportunity for you to manage it as an end-to-end -end Absolutely. Basis. I would like to us to go back to the 11% intra-regional trade, but before we do so, I wanted you to give me a sketch, if you like, of where e business is easier to do from an imperial perspective. Where have you seen things improving? Is it here in Southern Africa? Is it West Africa? Is it Maghreb? Or do you go as far as Maghreb? 
uh, no, uh, not aware of that one. I got uh, Maghreb is the north part of Africa. I got which is your your, your Ethiopia, Sudan, mm -hmm. etc. Little triangle there, mm -hmm. or is it EAC? Yeah. Yeah, so our focus is on sub-Saharan Africa only, right. so not, not the, the far northern parts of, okay. of Africa. Well, you are the same as CNBC Africa. Yes. We also focus yeah. on sub-Saharan <laughs> Africa. Yeah. So I think in terms of where it's easier. Yeah, um, or where things have been getting better. Yeah, I think probably the answer on our side would be, and, and Dougie can assist there, it's more where we've yeah. struck the right partnerships. Okay. You know, so I don't think there's any place that's easy to do business. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but if you strike partnerships with people that have been there, that have lived in the country and developed it, it's worked well for us. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been um, very fortunate from that perspective in, in Nigeria and in Ghana because we, we formed the right relationships. But then in Kenya, we've, our, our health sciences business has done really well because it, okay. we acquired a business that established itself there and therefore yeah. it's effective. Does language help? Guys, help me out here. Does language help? Does it make a big difference? Look, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Who wants uh, to come in? Yeah, yeah I'll, I can come in here, yeah, Godfrey. Sure. Though we've actually done some studies, so just some empirical, uh, some some empirical evidence to to back up what Corbus is saying. I then you about were going the to say imperial evidence. Yeah, I, I, I'm <laughs> sure there's some imperial evidence as well. <laughs> you're you're that, cornered by these two big guys. Yeah, I know, and I, I'm very I'm very aware of that. So. Um, so that's why I'm going to support the comments that they've been making. <laughs> and, um, uh, but we've done, some, we've done some extensive studies of this yeah. to measure the connectedness of African countries with each other and with the rest of the world. Mm. It's a study that was sponsored by, at first by Visa, but we, um, we have now taken this into the academic realm. Yeah. And we measure really, it's called the TCIP, the Trade, Capital, Information and People, okay. and how uh, countries, how the movement of these, uh, these areas are, or these these subjects are, are taking place between borders or between countries. Yeah. And the findings really uh, did indicate that East Africa is by far the most integrated. I don't think that's a major surprise because no. the East African com community has progressed quite rapidly over the last few years. Yeah. And that Kenya is the one that is driving uh, integration with Africa and with its African partners more than any other African country. Wow. I know that um, you know there were wow. these recent demands that Kenya was going to uh, implement uh, visa requirements for South Africans that would have flown in the face of of it engaging. A oh, reciprocal after what the South Africans did. Yeah, but we do have more uh, South African investment in Kenya than there are Kenyan investments here. So who would sure. who, it would actually be shooting the Kenyan eco economy, economy in, the, in foot the foot if you implement that? I mean, this is diplomacy 101, but back in yeah. the 17th century, yeah. we now a modern we are a modern economy. Yeah. Uh, let's actually create much mo much more connectedness between these countries. Yeah, yeah. The point I'm creating is creating an open line to the president for you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, sure. thanks for that, Godfrey. But <laughs> The point is, and, and then going back to the 11% intra-regional trade, etc. Yeah. In East Africa, it's very, very different. Uh -huh. They've got much higher levels of intra-regional trade. Those countries there are aware that they need to actually uh, connect, they need to integrate yeah. to create economies of scale. Yeah. This, African, this rise in African narrative mm. is totally irrelevant when you look at Kenya on its own or Uganda. Yeah, absolutely. Or, because these countries are tiny. Yeah. Collectively, yeah. they are something. Individually, they are actually irrelevant in the global context. And also, certainly, the evidence has been, uh, has been shown, isn't it? Because when you look at the map of Africa, and if you look at where that growth is coming from, East Africa and West Africa are the places where actually most of that growth is coming. We're being saved on this side by Mozambique and Angola. Check out those two economies in Southern Africa as the dog, without question. Now, Andrew, I want to bring you in. How do we then, from 11%, I mean, we can only talk about opportunity, isn't it? Mm. What's required to make sure that that uh, opportunity is captured? Especially, I mean, we, our discussion is around logistics, but what's required on that front to make sure that that uh, opportunity is actually uh, uh, realized? Uh, Godfrey, you know, we, we've just completed a report, Africa Gearing Up, a PwC document that focuses okay. on the structure of the African economy and the challenges around transport and logistics. And one thing that's interesting that emerges from that is as uh, uh, Africa started to shift away from being a co totally commodity-based <coughs> entity or country, <coughs> is you start to get this growth in the middle class. And so you get consumers okay. and huge growth in consumers. Okay. So and consumers. those consumers are driving the need for product. And that product generally has to be sold through retail outlets. Now, some of that is imported. The large majority is imported. But you're starting to see a shift towards a requirement for domestic agriculture, more formalized agriculture, more formalized manufacturing. And you're starting to see a shift where countries that are neighboring can provide that product in a structured way right. as opposed to bringing it from Europe or even from South Africa. And so right. uh, chains like ShopRite 
have very sophisticated um, supply chains to get access into all of these countries, Nigeria, yeah. Ghana, etc. But they're starting to be under more and more pressure to look for product domestically mm -hmm. and bring that domestic product into their retail chains. Mm -hmm. And that is driving a switch towards increases or changes in those economy which favor uh, deeper agriculture and more entrenched manufacturing. Yeah. And we'll build on that and, yeah. and that will become the base for further trade. Yeah, and what's your sense? Is it the approach that uh, uh, Cobas is talking about here, where you have one uh, or one entity that takes the whole uh, product through the whole process of getting it from uh, manufacturer to consumer? I think it depends on the markets. I uh -huh. think um, from Imperial's perspective, they have a very structured process around pharmaceuticals, if I understand. But yeah. in 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 market, uh, markets that are a bit more diverse, retail markets, I think it will become a multitude of different players yeah. that will take product into those markets with different types of approaches around branding, selling, and those those um, uh, brand owners will, I suppose, drive what um, actually reaches those particular markets. The key yeah. thing, though, is to have a very effective supply chain behind any product or market that yeah. you're bringing into Africa yeah. because it's really reliant on that. That's the focus for actually making those products sell in the long term. Yeah, you want to come in? Uh, maybe just to add to that, I think there's a, there's a distinct difference between a, the macro and the micro perspective. Mm. Because the, the, the macro perspective is more of a long term perspective. Sure. So all of the things that Andrew is saying, I agree <coughs> with. But when we engage with manufacturers yeah. that will put up infrastructure in African countries, that will own a brand and yeah. that wants to sell that brand. Right. It's a much shorter conversation. I actually wanted to come to you on that and how you approach it, but go on. Because that, that's critically important, like, like um, Lyle was saying earlier, the critical mass doesn't exist in East Africa in one country only. So if a, a company like Tiger Brands, a South African manufacturer, wants to set up in Kenya, yeah. it's important that strategically they know which is the, the second, the third, and the fourth country yeah. they go to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the conversation with us, on the logistic side to start off with yeah. is how do you how do you get me from Kenya into the other seven? Right. The second conversation and, and um, also adding to what Lyle was saying earlier, integration mm -hmm. comes with maturity. Yes. We have simply positioned ourselves from a complexity point of view. Yeah. To say logistics, mm -hmm. yes, sales, yes, and marketing, yes. Yeah. We have the opportunity to have the conversation with a multinational manufacturer right. where all three of the executives are in the same room and, and have the same problems or challenges that they want to address. Yeah. So on a micro level, we're having the conversation. Yeah. On the macro level, I think Andrew and Lyle yeah. play a much larger role to understand the continent much better. Yeah. We have simplified it by saying, get you there, sell your product and yeah. build your brand, because that's what the requirement yeah. was. Yeah, for because me. often we say that uh, you know, the companies actually are much faster than governments in trying to access these opportunities, yeah, and uh, here is a prime example of that. Mm -hmm. But you spoke earlier about the fact that you guys, what you do is you go and you work with partners. Yes. But what about skills? Do you find that's an easier challenge to deal with when you have to take people under your wing and then you have to introduce them, if you like, to the imperial way? Yes, absolutely. Uh, look, I mean, we as South Africans are in business fairly aggressive, uh, yes. fairly fast. Some would say too aggressive. Some would say too <laughs> aggressive. So, so, you know, there were companies that we got involved in through an acquisition that for the first 18 months of our involvement sitting on the board, yeah. it was difficult not to affect changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But having the conversation and, and also enlightening people to successes that we've had, yeah. then you get the, the, the um, the collaboration and you get the desire to work together to make things yeah. better. So we're not, we're not, I mean, we've got a very, very few expats in, in Africa. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that approach as well. Do mm -hmm. you take South Africans into the continent at all? Do you train and then, as we were saying earlier, introduce them to the Imperial Way? No, so, so again, what Kuba said earlier, the partners that we choose there are so important for us. Mm -hmm. So if we choose the right partners and the right quality of management at the partner level, yeah. then we work with the partners and the management in country to, yeah. to upskill. Yeah. Lyle, I want you to come in as well and cop us because I want to understand when you go into these countries and you say we are partners, we're working together, and we spoke earlier about the attitude that South Africans sometimes are too aggressive, but there's also the, 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 the perspective that you know South Africans want to come and uh, recolonize us mm -hmm. uh, after what the Europeans did years ago, etc. How difficult a conversation is that? 
And given our approach to partnering yeah. and our legacy of acquisitions, yeah. for us it's a much easier discussion. It is. So because we actually acquire business, yeah. but on a partnership basis, so in many cases retaining... Did you take control? No, we take control yeah. in, in, in most cases. Okay. But we leave equity in the hands of the partners. So they remain part of the business. So yeah. the discussion is never about how do we take over your business. Yeah. It's about how we take your capabilities, right. add to that, as you refer to, the, some of the imperial way and, and involve them in a bigger picture. Yeah. So the partnerships work because people buy into yeah. the structure of the transaction typically allows them to still get value from the future interaction. Yeah. Um, and that's the way in which we build it. And, yeah. and the same partnerships that we built in South Africa with you know, other transport providers or yeah. subcontracted providers yeah. we yeah. will have with other people across the continent yeah. as well. But Lionel, maybe Imperial has got a certain way that they are doing this right. From your experience and other companies working to the continent, is it an easy discussion? Is it an easy no. way of transferring yeah. skills and uh, getting people to... I think, I don't think, think there's the a fixed way? template on how you, you engage in terms yeah. of the partnership and in terms of, uh, so it depends very much on, on what works for your company, the, yeah. the culture of the company and also the way you've rolled it out in Africa. But the other one is in terms of the country that you're going into. So if you look at our retailers, they have by and large gone into the continent without partners. Yeah. And those that have gone in with partners, we don't need to mention their names right now, but uh, many of okay. them... Today you have license. You but can but as many, many of them like, uh, have, uh, have faulted now with, with, their, with their partnership. So right. the partnership thing in Africa, I always talk about this, I, uh, that I say it's, it's important to have some local partnerships, some local flavor in that. Yeah. But it's not the, the be all and end all because it's the, 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 the partnership can, can take very various shapes and yeah. forms as well. So and there are also places where people actually appreciate the skill that's coming from outside because it's recognized it has actually worked. Yeah, the, the, big, the most important thing though, Godfrey, is is to invest in talent in those in those markets. Right. Let's never forget that, and I don't want to go on to the whole um, the the role of business in development, but yeah. it's not you not it's not your role in development. It's actually your role in creating markets for the future and and skills and talent yeah. to sustain your business into the future in those new markets. Absolutely, by investing in the people in those countries. Let's take uh, a short commercial break. Please stay tuned to CNBC Africa. We'll be right back and we will be talking more on the state and future of transport and logistics on the African continent. Welcome back. You are watching Africa's Roadmap and we are talking about logistics and transport around the African continent. In the studio, I've got with me Andrew Shaw, he's Associate Director, Capital Projects and Infrastructure Solutions at PwC. That's a big, big post, eh, Andrew? It is a big post with a big name. Doug Truta, he is the CEO of Imperial Logistics Africa Division. Lyle White is Director of uh, the Center for Dynamic Markets and Senior Lecturer at Gibbs and Cobus Rousseau. He is Chief Business Development Officer, Imperial Logistics. Gentlemen, we've been talking about getting these goods across the border, the complexities, the difficulties, and one challenge we haven't talked about is the big, as they say, elephant in the room, corruption. We know what happens at the border post. There is corruption at the border post. Let me begin with you um, by just asking, from a company perspective, how do you approach it? How, what do you tell your employees? We don't entertain corruption at all. Sure. So that's a message, and we emphasize the message as often as we can. Um, sitting at my, at, at my level, obviously, I've never come across any corruption traveling extensively in Africa. Sure. Um, I've said to the board before, I'm sure some way, somehow, some of our trucks must have come into contact yeah. with something like that. All we can do is reinforce the fact that we, yeah. don't, we don't entertain corruption. The values of the company. The values of the companies are what they are, and that's our stance. Yeah. Now, that is his level. Coppers, from your level, <laughs> I would imagine you go in, you talk to the real people, and you discuss with them how to manage the brand, you discuss with them uh, how to get the product to the consumer, etc., etc., are those issues that come up, and we're generalizing here, I realize that, because I mean, we're talking about 54, as I said, and 56, if you take my other definition. Mm. So absolutely, that, that is the way we engage as a business, whether yeah. that's from the top to the bottom. I think our, our multinational clients also appreciate mm. the fact that that's the way yeah. we do business. Yeah. So I think it's important that corruption or bribery comes, yeah. there's two parties involved. Yes. So, and we just don't, don't make that part of the way we do business. Yeah. Um, and that's the way we execute business. Yeah. It's interesting because I remember the first time I crossed it at sort of at an open level, if you like. Uh, I'd, I'd done an interview with uh, one of the uh, presidents from across the continent. I can't name my names now. And uh, after the interview, this guy comes to me and he says to me, um, this is a little thank you to you. I say, what is it? Oh, he says, it's, you know, it's, it's something that I do. We just want to say thank you to you and your boys for doing a good job. I said, no, you don't need to thank me because, you know, this is what 
what I do. This is my job. They don't come to you like that. Yeah, no. So we that's open. Yes. So we it's actually part of the way we do business. Yeah. Uh, no. So we don't entertain. Study wise, though, you guys would have gone and studied and talked to the people. You would have gone through the border post and your thesis and what these guys are producing. Give us a sense of just how bad the, a, a, a problem this is, or is it not? that big a problem and we in the media no, love these stories. No, Godfrey, it's an enormous problem. It's an, an, an enormous problem around the world. You know, levels yeah. of corruption in Latin America are even far higher than they are here in Africa. And that's, that's one of the things that we, that we must come to terms with. We, yeah. uh, corrupt practices enter into places uh, where we have these complexities and where we have what we call institutional voids, those gaps in the, in, in the institutional well, fabric what, what of these places. What do you mean places. institutional voids? What well, is that? Well, exactly that. The gaps in the institutional fabric that actually help things continue or transactions to take place okay. in, a, in a normal kind of uh, modern or sophisticated uh, economic environment. Okay, in other words, where the institution does as it's supposed to do and it actually works. Yeah, when the institution works and there's yeah. no need to actually for interference or there are no, there's no need for, um, for alternative systems or yeah. alternative services okay. to fill those okay. or to plug those holes, those, those gaps in that. Yeah. But um, you talk about border posts, but have you ever landed at Lagos Airport? Yes. And when you, la when you landed at Lagos Airport, or did you wait in the lines with everybody else? You need else? assistance to be able to get in. So now, Godfrey, is that not corruption? Because you're paying somebody to help you through the lines. It is not. Is it not or is it? He's just shaking his head. Oh. But uh, I'm thinking, I, I, it hasn't happened to me elsewhere. What I'm trying to illustrate is that it's not as cut and dry as what everybody makes it out to be. If, because... Um, and it is a point. Because that is... That's the practice. You are paying somebody to actually lubricate the process of going through those checkpoints in the airport. If you are just an ordinary citizen, you have to wait in that line. Yeah. Those, uh, they call them protocol officers. Yes. Those are getting paid off to help you go through. They, right. pa they in turn pay the security at the airport to help you go through and to yeah. jump certain queues. Yeah. That, Godfrey, is corruption. Okay. Dougie, you were shaking your head, but I also entered, want to enter to come in. So uh, we don't enter any country with protocol. Okay. Yeah, so if I have to stand in a line, as, I stand as, in as a line. As a standard rule. As a standard rule, we don't do protocol into any country. We stand in the line, and we know that we have to be very fast to get to the front of the queue sure. in Nigeria, for instance. Yeah. And I have on more than one occasion actually put my arms out and said, but no one is coming past me now with a stack of passports. <laughs> yeah, because I have a visa and I have the right to be there. Yeah. Now, they frown upon it, yeah. but yeah. then they check your passport and yeah. they yeah. process you yeah. and you actually go Yeah, through. you remind me of a time when I nearly got into a fight, actually. <laughs> so, so, so there are things where you sit in lounges yeah. where people say they had to pay $10, this, that and the mm -hmm. other, and every time you say to them, but you've just been corrupt. Yeah. And you didn't yeah. have to it because they, I the just wanted to check your, your luggage again. Yeah. Yeah. They can check the luggage 10 oh, times for all I can. So I think there are certain ways and yeah. attitudes yeah. that can make a very fast difference yeah. at a very high level. Because people like ourselves, yeah. that fly business class into countries, sure. don't have <laughs> to use protocol. <coughs> yeah. You don't have yeah. to do that. No, fair point, fair point. Andrew? Look, I suppose as PwC, um, we have, as, as the rest of the big four are, are so negative around uh, corruption yeah. and our focus is on integrity and honesty that it actually helps us within the market because yeah. people approach us with that dynamic. Mm -hmm. But just to give you a sense of where corruption can have a negative effect on economic growth is yeah. when you're starting to do feasibility and business plans for people that are entering the continent, yeah. the big risk of corruption is it's unknown. You don't know how big it is. You don't know how, uh, how it'll affect your business. Will it stop your business? Mm. Is it something that just, for example, in the DRC, it's widely known, as many of you uh, probably um, have experienced, that mm. there is high levels of corruption. Mm. And as a consequence, people are very risk averse about going into those yeah, economies. And being caught in that situation. Correct. Yeah. Because they don't know what the outcome is likely to be. And yeah. so reducing levels of corruption is a key element to actually growing this economy, the, yeah. the whole broader African economy. Absolutely. I think uh, Doug has a point. It begins with the individual. If you tack it into your own hands that you will not be part of it, absolutely, absolutely. it will delay you for a two. I spent one time 13 hours at the border because I refused to get into, uh, to get someone to facilitate it as it were. But I want to come back to you and talk about the opportunities because, I mean, we've talked about all the dark things now. Let's talk about the opportunities. So Imperial is a big company, the biggest transport company in Africa, I think, by sales, if we've done our numbers right. Where are you guys looking at and what's attracting you? So From a logistics perspective, who, where are you pumping those South African goods that when the workers are in the factories, they are getting out? The opportunities are a challenge. It might sound funny. Because sure. you have to prioritize what it is that you want to be for whom. Yeah. Um, we, are, we are an international company, so we have 
customers that are international customers that want to go into certain countries yeah. that are outside the strategy that we have crafted for the rest of Africa. So we have to be careful what the opportunities are that we that we entertain and what the opportunities are that we say no thank you for. Right. Um, those opportunities in, in getting involved in these countries and getting involved with other partners yeah. can again be passed on to some of your business partners. So how have you been doing it? Have you been going on your own, scouting, finding, or you go only when your customer goes? So the value that we add to the companies that we partner with in Africa, I think, uh, starts with the fact that we own very high level relationships with multinationals and manufacturers right. that sits on a global scale. So many a time, also paying the right price for the business because you are adding the value. Yes. Um, gives, uh, get us ahead in, in, in some of these countries. Yeah. So the opportunities are there. Yeah. Very careful because you have skills limitations. Sure. You have system limitations. Yeah. And you know, guys like Quivers that does business development yeah. sometimes are annoyed that we don't take an opportunity. But it's important that you are right because you only have one chance yeah. to do it right. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of those opportunities breaking down into sectors, where is that coming in? Because I think we all know Africa's story started with raw commodities and this stuff being shipped mm. to the ports and et cetera, et cetera. But now the narrative is changing a little bit. So we hear now there's an African consumer. People spoke about a billion people. People are talking about the fact that we've got a rising middle class. Mm. So that Where are, what are you guys seeing? Absolutely. So yeah. that, that is our focus area. Yeah. So what? absolutely looking Which at the, co the consumer side. The so consumer the cons side, The yeah. rapid consumerization of Africa. Yeah. That is where we see the opportunity as there are more and more people and more and more households that have that $1 a day more that they can spend on consumer products, consumer electronics, pharmaceutical yeah. products, that we will be there to make sure that the route to market develops for them to have access to that product. Mm -hmm. And we are... We are quite focused on that yeah. rather than on the other elements of logistics and supply chains right. where other people may be better suited to do that. So right. infrastructure development, industrial yeah. logistics yeah. is not our core I focus. was going to say, isn't there a big opportunity there as well? But maybe the other two gentlemen come in, can, can come in because we still need to take stuff out of the DRC. Mm. Yes. We still need to go in big time in Angola when it mm. does open up yeah. and actually yeah. becomes a normal country. So I think that the practical realities of, of transport yeah. is that that product flows in multiple directions. Yeah. So th for that reason, we will still be involved in extracting yeah. big volumes out of Africa. That's but isn't that a bigger business. challenge for you to go into the consumer sector? Because obviously you're talking porous perishables and you're talking Absolutely. about uh, 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 delicate things that need to be moved and arrive there yes. before they are broken. So, they, But you said we're not talking about challenges, but about opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly the opportunity. So yeah. How do you get that brand that we all know, that, yeah. we've, been, that we've grown up with, but a branded product, not necessarily the most perishable one, sure. but many, many products. How do you get that in the right pack format, in the yeah. right market? Yeah. And not only in formal retail, so not yeah. only through the, what the, the traditional retailers would do, but how right. do you make sure that it gets onto the table or onto the, the informal market access to yes. it? Getting, getting it there, setting the product and building the yeah, brand yeah, yeah. Is, is the area in which So that's what you're talking about earlier, about the fact that you have to work with these people from a branding perspective and make them understand that the whole process needs to be done seamlessly, Absolutely. perhaps by one institution. Well, we offer that integrated service, so that, yeah. that route to market, because yeah. then people sitting somewhere else who has never been in Africa or yeah. don't understand the market yeah, yeah, can yeah. look towards us to say, well, you help us provide this entire yeah. solution. Yeah. And we'll measure you on how well we do as a brand yeah. to access the consumers in Africa. Sure. And that, that entire service offering then makes us a more viable partner sure. oh. than somebody that may only be a marketing agency or yeah. only be a transport. Let's widen the conversation. We're talking transport, we're talking logistics, but let's widen the conversation a little bit into the other areas of opportunity. I spoke about uh, the stuff that we still need to get to the DRS, and we still see those big trucks going up with equipment and that kind of thing. How big an opportunity does that remain? Where the DRC or, or just DRC generally? DRC into the rest of the continent. Um, I think the I think that uh, infrastructure development remains an enormous opportunity. It's a it's a great challenge at the moment, yeah. but um, it's an enormous opportunity. And we know we know the wealth of the, the DRC. There's uh, as you were mentioning the wealth in, in Angola. We go further we go further north east and we go to other consumer markets again in in parts of um, of of, the, of East Africa, uh, mm -hmm. Ethiopia as well in the Horn. But what we are discovering now, I mean, it's not only it's not only in uh, the stuff that's in the ground. We have oil and gas. We have the biggest oil and gas discoveries in the world taking place in the northern true. parts of, of Mozambique and, and just off that coast. And Tanzania. Um, the the resource potential in Africa is is literally endless. It's yeah. um, 
uh, as war and conflict has ended, it's, it's uh, helped us um, navigate our way across the continent and find new uh, sources. Yeah. And um, with technology now, we are able to access that. Yeah. So what, yeah. it, what, what African countries need to do to realize this is to yeah. be competitive. They've yeah. got to realize that if they, they have the comparative advantage in forms of in the different areas of resources. Actually. But you know, across the Atlantic, we have Peru and, yeah. and other parts of the world that are are equally as rich to some degree, yeah. but that are building a competitiveness within those economies, and that's what we need to focus on in Africa. Yeah. Doug, I'll come back to you and ask why you would not look at the other sectors in a moment, but I wanted to go to uh, uh, Andrew and talk about some of the stats that I was building ahead of the show. I mean, uh, one of the stats I saw is that road freight is four times likely to be more expensive. Again, you guys can come in uh, here and talk about that. Four times more expensive in Africa than in any other part of the world. Uh, and in terms of power, 38% of, uh, of Africa Africans have access to power and then when you look at uh, ports there are about 64 ports I saw and uh, the capacity and performance shoe you're talking about totally widely different things here and handling costs a lot 50% more but that's an opportunity isn't it it's a huge opportunity because yeah. as you become more effective and as the supply Even for your logistics firm as well yeah for the logistics firms to come in and bring uh, credible operational um, uh, improvements to some of these supply chains, yeah. you will start to see improvements. I mean, the focus on retail supply chains requires a specific um, uh, a focus of attention of how you bring those in, but I still think there's huge opportunities in the big commodity export okay. um, lines, yeah. railway lines, yeah. connecting with ports, export of coal, um, iron ore, manganese, bauxite. A lot of these finds within Africa remain trapped in Africa. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mozambique has got to be the classic example. Yeah. It's got a super large coal field that can get a very small amount of that to, to market. And so there's a huge opportunity there. Yeah. But the one additional market opportunity that I wanted to, to just bring, bring up is as we look at this change in Africa and African economies, is you begin to see the opportunity for agricultural development. And some right. countries have uh -huh. started to develop True. in that space. Kenya is probably, outside of South Africa, is probably the single um, best example of where a country has started to develop effective agricultural supply chains. Yeah. I mean, cut flowers, um, fresh vegetables, tea, a number of areas which previously it wasn't a large competitor in. Yeah. And given the amount of arable land in Africa, this yeah. is again a huge opportunity, yeah, a long-term opportunity. Data, the other start around uh, Africa having probably the best agricultural Correct. unused land in the whole world. Yeah. Um, I was hoping that Dagi was taking notes because this is what you should be looking at. I'm asking him to talk so that you can listen to that opportunity uh, in addition to, of course, FMCG. The, the, the corridors in SADC, yeah. as it stands now, is overtraded. Mm -hmm. So okay. logistics transport per se becomes right. a commodity very fast. Okay. So there are a few players in the commodity market that controls the market. Okay. And the swing between the Dallas Alarm Corridor, the North-South Corridor, the Baira Corridor and the Balfour's Bay Corridor happens fluidly. Uh -huh. So just being exposed to one corridor with a large fleet of vehicles, Casambuleza like they said, yeah. one, one border post can halt an operation of 100 vehicles mm. for two weeks. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, there are inherent risks <coughs> and dangers yeah. on just doing the, the, the corridors that are currently available for transport. Yeah. A point that Andrew is making now is the second biggest, biggest um, contributor to GDP in Nigeria is agriculture. The, the, the current practice in Nigeria is for all those that goes from Lagos north returns empty. Right. Why? Uh, it's just the practice. So if you ask people there, they say it is how it's done. So there needs to be an investigation around... <laughs> I'm hoping around you understand why. <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there, there needs to be an investigation around, you know, what are the agricultural products? Is it as simple as equipment going north yeah. or not the same equipment that comes south? That's true. So those are the type of things that needs to be done and the studies that yeah. needs to be done yeah. that could change the transport landscape in a country like Nigeria tomorrow yeah. morning. Yeah. Yeah. So there are certain things sure. that needs to happen. <laughs> We are currently focused in SADC. Yeah. We've got a large fleet of vehicles in Nigeria, um, and we are renewing the fleet as we go along. Sure. But the customers that we've had forever has been waiting for us to put good technical facilities in which we did, mm. and to have vehicles there that is of a certain quality, yeah. and that can do a job better than what the normal yeah. is yeah. in Nigeria. Yeah. So no, 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 when you go and you find your partners and you pay for them, you want to come in, just give me a second, because I wanted to understand from his side, in terms of uh, the values that you're paying for those businesses. 
how big an issue has it become? Or are you still finding good value where you pay good money and you get good uh, 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 investment in return? And, and the, the first large acquisition with, that we've done in the continent, we've actually paid NAV for the business. Wow. So we haven't paid one cent of goodwill for the business. Wow. Because there was a mature partner sitting on the other side that wanted certain skills that we had. Uh -huh. So it was an exchange skills for equity. And that partnership has given us a soft landing and has given us a good partnership to understand the lay of the land. Right. So working off that basis gives you a competitive advantage, yeah. without yeah. a doubt. And do you ready to come in? Yeah, I'm fine for the moment. Before he does, okay. Come in. Yeah, so maybe if we come back to Mozambique as the example, yeah. in terms of, of the, the new developments in, in oil and gas. Yeah. So we can say get very excited about that infrastructure development. And, yeah. and yes, we have skills in South Africa that we'd like to deploy let's yes. say at an engineering level or feasibility mm. level. But for us to now get excited about infrastructure logistics yeah. would be inappropriate because that's not our business here. So what do we bring to uh, Northern Mozambique development from a, you know, an abnormal load logistics perspective? Are you talking to Dougie? No, so I'm talking <laughs> to you asking what are we not doing? So I we think he's trying to say to him, man, don't even well, look elsewhere. No, so I'm saying we, we can't be in Africa what we yeah. haven't been anywhere else. Sure. So it would be a very dangerous approach. Understood. We get excited about that because uh -huh. if that works and if they structure it correctly, yeah. and it's not just the export of gas, yeah. but they actually develop the country. You have got business. There will be lots more people that yeah. want to buy another beer or another pack of cigarettes uh -huh. or another box of soap okay. that we want to make sure that they okay. have access to that as a, as a sustainable consumer supply chain okay. or mm. pharmaceuticals. Okay. That's our focus because we're good at that and we can get that done. Yeah. You can't go into Africa and do whatever comes up. And uh, Dougie made the point that the many opportunities is the risk. Sure. You have to focus and we've elected to focus on this consumer pharmaceutical market yeah. because we really think we bring a and you've got partners already our, in that environment to our, to our customers. Understand the systems. And you uh, Look, I fully understand where you're coming from, Kervis, but I think in Africa there are huge opportunities to link an effective supply chain with the underlying infrastructure development. Yeah. And whether somebody else pays for that or you're packaging it in a particular way, yeah. there are massive opportunities, both in the commodity space, yeah. but also in operating things like ports, in inland terminals, etc. I think there are opportunities there, and somebody who has probably got access to some capital base yeah. can unlock some of those opportunities. So, so absolutely, we're just saying it won't be us. Yeah. So it, within South Africa, we're not a port operator. We're not. We are not an infrastructure player. Yeah. So absolutely, some of our competitors are leaders in that field, and and we love for them to take on those challenges, which allows us to focus on what we're focusing on. So right. no, absolutely, it must be done. Yeah. You want to come in? No, I'm just actually listening to, to that because I do yeah. believe what, and when, while Corbus is speaking, is uh, what, what is interesting is that you, you do really see that entities like this actually start adding value to what has traditionally been resource extraction in, yeah. in, in, in Africa. Absolutely. And, and we talk a lot about extractive in institutions and those types of things. What, if we start doing what he's saying right now and adding value, yeah. The, the, the growth story will be one that is realized, but is also sustainable. Because yeah. we, again, yeah. we get back to that point of creating And it's a big story. It's a big so, story. Because the other day I was talking to uh, a researcher. I think he works in agriculture here in South Africa. It was this whole debate around land. And this guy was making the point that, yes, I can give you a piece of land. You can go there and you can grow the product. But actually, the money is not to be made on the land. The money is to be made in the value chain that develops along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it, it really hits home when, uh, when Kurbus was talking about um, Mozambique because I think Mozambique is at the cusp of 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 absolute transformation and but there's a, a huge potential there's enormous potential but yeah, yeah. everybody looks at this and they go will it fall victim to yet another resource curse sure mm -hmm. and when and I've just and I've traveled to Mozambique frequently I was just mm -hmm. there a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and you when they talk about the numbers this is a country that is going to attract about four or five times FDI foreign direct investment to the size of its GDP yeah yeah. This isn't just big. This has never happened in world yeah. economic history. Uh, absolutely. I remember a so friend of mine. So how are they going to manage that? Yeah. Uh, and, that's what it, and that's why this value adding yeah. and to make sure that the oil and gas actually is not just about extract, yeah. uh, extraction, but you add yeah. value to that, that, yeah. that chain. Along the way, yeah. Mm. Three years ago, a friend of mine said to me, I'm going, I'm going to buy an apartment in Maputo. And I said, are you mad? He says, this, is, this place is going to boom. When you look at the potential oh, in terms of investment that's mm. coming in, you have to be here. But we're running out of time. So we need to get our closing remarks here in terms of where we're seeing those opportunities. And I want us to talk about opportunities. I don't want us to talk about the negative stuff anymore. I'll begin from uh, you, Andrew, and sweep right in. In terms of, let's focus it, 
on uh, transport and logistics within the continent in terms of opportunity. Sum it up for us from your perspective. Look, Godfrey, from my perspective is you have commodities as a lead and you have oil and gas in, in that space, but you're getting a massive rollout into um, a emerging uh, middle class that is uh, booming, that requires more and more commodity goods. Yeah. And on the basis of this, you just need more and more growth based on effective supply yeah. chains, both in the retail space yeah. and in the commodity space. I'm hoping that uh, uh, you would be able to give us, uh, Dagi, a sense of how big Imperial is going to become in this space. If we take all the opportunities that these guys are talking about, obviously mindful of what he wants uh, to see that. Imperial is going to become very big in this space. Sure. So we are absolutely set. Our strategy 2020 is on the rest of Africa. We, we believe that we're going to experience slower growth in South Africa. Sure. So the expertise, the money, everything follows into the rest of Africa. Yeah. And we want to put an a infrastructure together from a logistic sales and marketing perspective that sure. enables the brand owners, the multinationals, yeah. To sell to the consumers that that are in in, in Africa. Uh, just very briefly, Godfrey. Sure. I think I think obviously the commodity the commodity boom is something that will be in our certainly in our lifetime something that still drives Africa's economic growth, yeah. along with the civil works and infrastructure development. Yeah. But what we should, as South Africans, as South African companies, be mindful of is the value add <coughs> that we can provide through services, the services that surround all these things. Because we always think about these hard <coughs> tangibles of the commodities and the infrastructure, but we mm. forget about the services which we are very well positioned to take mm. uh, to take into Africa, mm. very, very well positioned, mm. and a lot better than other dynamic markets and other emerging powers, the likes of Brazil and China come to mind. Absolutely. We, ac we actually do know how to run services, and you look at our service providers across the continent, yeah. they are all very, very competitive and very, very strong, and the story of their success has not been told just yet in, in the African continent. Absolutely. Kobas, your final word. Yes, I think that the opportunity uh, is, is really that you have this consumers developing in Africa and you have yeah. fantastic products and brands in the entire world, including in Africa. And for us, it's a privilege to link those up, yeah. to be able to take people lower risk, more, more opportunities, yeah. take the constraints away and really make sure that those products end up end up with the consumers. Take the constraints away, take away the pain of crossing Africa's endless borders. I was just amazed by one stat which says that uh, Africa actually in terms of landmass is bigger than Europe, the US, China and India put together. So the opportunity probably is just as big. That's the end of our discussion today on Africa's Roadmap. Thank you for joining us and thank you to my guests, Andrew Shaw, PwC, Dougie Truta, Imperial Logistics Africa, Lyle White from Gibbs and uh, Cobas Rousseau from Imperial Logistics. Until next time, thank you for joining us. Good evening. <laughs>